Welcome to the Clay Studio. This is Komuti Sivasankara, founder CEO, the guiding light art company, building bright futures through art. Today, in the ninth episode of the Glaze What Next series, Change Management and Practice, we are meeting a strategy consultant, business transformation, and organizational change management expert, Raghuveer Ram Kumar. Raghuveer started his career with a background in technology. However, he chose to leverage that background in the industry context and over time developed functional skills to become a strategy consultant. Having leveraged his cross-sector experience and transferable skills, his career progress is a good example of an organic yet different career evolution Let's listen to his perspective and his take on change management and practice. Raghuvi, welcome to the Glaze What Next series, Change Management and Practice. I am super happy to be interviewing you. There's a lot I have learned about you. We have talked I think a few years ago when you were thinking of your MBA uh, and then we've been in touch so there's been a journey we have been touch basing with each other regularly to understand what we are doing maybe not in great detail so there's a lot that I want to cover but before I want to you know go all over the place I would just let you open up the floor and introduce yourself briefly so thanks, Gomiti. Uh, lovely to see you again. Absolutely. I think uh, just looking back, I can't believe that we've been in touch for almost six, seven years now. That's when I started looking at MBA options and reached out to you to explore uh, yeah. because you had been through that journey at that point in time. Yeah. So, so thanks for inviting me to be part of this uh, webinar. Uh, really pleased to join you this afternoon. Uh, hello everybody, I'm Raghu, uh, Raghuvi Ramkumar. I currently work as a, a senior strategy consultant at Arab Group. I've uh, been with Arab for about uh, three and a half years now. And then uh, prior to that, I spent about six, six and a half years with IBM as, as a strategy consultant in organizational change. Uh, I started off uh, in the technology division, uh, but then you know, over time, while at IBM, I, I learned about things such as agile, social business, uh, which kind of paved the foundation for me to embark on an MBA, uh, specializing in strategy from Lancaster University Management School. And then now I currently work as a strategy consultant. Change in the sector, though, I currently work in the infrastructure sector, worked with Arab for the past three and a half years. Very pleased to be joining all of you today. So this is this you sitting here in uh, in the UK. Where exactly are you in in the UK right now? Sure, I'm I'm to the west of uh, London in in the city called Bristol, uh, which is southwest England. Um, yeah, so I'm currently based in Bristol, but this is my home office. But I yeah tend to work on on projects across the UK and beyond as well. Yeah. Super. I just want to go back into your, you know, past career um, approaches, and and I see a lot of things that you have tried, uh, experimented with yourself before, you know, coming here. And um, to start with, I know that you started out as in into B tech, uh, uh, of a technology or so, and then you move. On strategy, business transformation, and so on. How did that initially happen? Sure. So, yeah, absolutely. So I, I did my bachelor's in technology from Jawaharlal Nehru Technological University uh, in Hyderabad, uh, graduated in 2010, and then joined IBM um, in, in, in a team called Application Development and Solution Architecture, uh, mm -hmm. but had a very technology-focused role. But while I was in that role, I was very curious as to why I was doing what I was doing. 
and wanted to kind of understand the big picture of the things that I've been involved in. So, and that curiosity kind of made me, you know, navigate the organization. IBM was huge, uh, mm -hmm. is actually. So it gave me an opportunity to actually, you know, go around understanding what's going on, why is it going on, who is doing what, rather than just focused on my own thing. So that opened up, I would say, very, very frankly, a number of opportunities. So very early on, about 2011-12, when IBM published its uh, new strategy specializing in cloud analytics, mobile, social, and security, mm -hmm. and a team called uh, Mobile First to help drive the Mobile First strategy forward. Uh, mm -hmm. And subsequently, I was involved in driving social business transformation uh, across uh, our India, South Asia, uh, East Asia, Australasia, Central Eastern Europe, and Western Europe offices. Uh, and then there was a major transformation on Agile that was happening. So adopting Agile, kind of driving change, advocating Agile ways of working. So I took that on as another uh, challenge, uh, you know, specializing in that, that area. So I, I would say to, to summarize, you know, I did a number of things at IBM just trying to help me figure out what is it that I really want to be doing, what is it that I'm passionate about, where mm -hmm. does my interest lie, and yeah. it really came through networking, connecting, being curious, and not kind of just focused on what I was doing, but rather trying to kind of understand what's the impact of what I was doing and what's the big picture on, on things. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. I am more curious on this because you know it's it's very easy to find a profile that is highly technical and is growing in that area. Uh, and usually I have come across many of the profiles that are technical in nature that want to do the MBA in in European countries or so, and they do reach out to me uh, for some support. And when you talked and I looked at your profile, I was thinking, Okay, a technical guy, not technical, <laughs> into strategy more so. I think that is very unique. And a lot of people do want, um, maybe when they started out, they started out as technical, but they do want to grow into other profiles. Like, like the way, what would be the best way to approach, do you think, for somebody technical that wants to do this? Sure. So, uh, yeah, going back to the, there is su there is such a myth, uh, especially in, in in the community that looks to do an MBA around you know moving from one one sort of department to the other, one sort of career skill set to another. I think yeah. and people tend to kind of miss the entire sectoral domain aspect of things. So in my case, yes, I did have an undergraduate in technology. And yeah. I used all of that background mm -hmm. because I worked in the technology industry. So IBM, you did. You did. IBM is a technology company. So rather than mm -hmm. seeing it as a, a skill set, a functional skill set that I have to use, I mm -hmm. saw it more as a domain skill set or a sector skill set that I can apply. Mm -hmm. uh, so in fact, just yesterday I was, I was talking to uh, a, a student currently who's, who's in their final year. Uh, of uh, mechanical engineering and doing an integrated master's program specializing in chemistry uh, mm -hmm. uh, Birla Institute of Technology and Science and but at the same time they also were passionate about are passionate about uh, gaming and data analytics so mm. you know and and the thing that I was and they were confused about is what sort of career path I should choose. Should I go into core mechanical? Should I go into core chemical? Or should I actually sideline both of those and go to data analytics and gaming? And, you know, I said, why do you have to choose one, right? You, you take your passion in data analytics and, yeah. uh, uh, you know, gaming and see how that can be applied to a chemical mm -hmm. industry or a mechanical industry. You don't have to do a chemical job in the chemical industry. You could be doing a gaming job or a simulator job in the chemical industry. So I think you know, one major thing that I've observed, especially when it comes to management school applicants, is they, they tend to 
forget the fact that there is a big industry sectoral focus, domain focus that's out there. So the skill set mm -hmm. that you come with, you don't necessarily have to kind of shelve it and move on to something else. Instead, you can actually leverage that technical expertise oh. in, mm -hmm. in the industry that you're in and work out the functional skill set. So I would personally say I used my technology background heavily and it was I was well placed to work in the technology sector at that point. And then over time, learn a functional skill set, mm -hmm. which I did kind of specialize a bit in terms of my electives in my undergraduation. Uh, but mm -hmm. then really it was practical on the job. And thanks to IBM's Think Academy, uh, I, yeah, I learned a number of those uh, concepts and theoretical aspects of it. And then that mm -hmm. paid my foundation to specialize in strategy. And therefore I did a, I spent about quite some time at IBM working in that area and then did my MBA in strategy. And mm -hmm. then I wanted to change sector. So yeah. I'm going to retain my functional skill set, right? I, I'm going to be in the strategy function, but then I'm going to apply it in a different sector. Uh, yeah. So I chose Arup. And, and, and then, yeah, when I joined Arup, definitely did a bit of reading, uh, quite a bit of reading in terms of understanding, you know, what does it mean uh, when we say, you know, we're looking at water sector or highways or rail. You know, understanding mm -hmm. what the sector focus is all about. What are the things that you should know if you're going to be, you know, developing strategies and 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 things uh, in the infrastructure sector. So I spent quite some time understanding uh, the sector quite early on, uh, and then mm -hmm. start to kind of notice a number of transferable skills that you can bring and best practices from other industries as well. And yeah. that really uh, positioned me uh, in in this in this current role and the current work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I want to go back to your um, period in Nairobi, Kenya. You have spent some time there and you've been an uh, international pro bono consultant for a women's enterprise firm. How did that happen? What exactly was that all about? Sure. Uh, so. Uh, it is probably one of my memorable times while at IBM uh, and uh, a lifetime experience, especially living in Nairobi, uh, working with an international mm -hmm. of about 14, 15 uh, very highly talented people from around the world. It is brilliant. So IBM had this program called IBM Corporate Service Corps, uh, mm -hmm. where it selects uh, 100 people every year. Mm -hmm. um, it's 400,000 odd, odd IBMers around the world to mm -hmm. go on international pro bono projects, mm -hmm. in a country, which is none of our home country. Uh, no. so we were a group of about 15 of us who were chosen to work with the government of Kenya uh, in mm -hmm. 2014. And, mm -hmm. and as part of that, I was engaged in this project working with Women Enterprise Fund. You know, mm. essentially looking at, uh, so I was, I was actually working with three other people. So my colleagues were from Netherlands, Sweden, and the America. So mm -hmm. three different people and I was from India. So the four of us working with this small group of uh, uh, people from w Women Enterprise Fund. So our work was really looking at how can they become sustainable as an organization, you know, achieve mm -hmm. more financial sustainability. Uh, okay. And at the same time, also start to think about what should their kind of long-term roadmap look like. Mm -hmm. So they have vision in terms of supporting the uh, social and economic pillar of the Kenya 2030 uh, vision. Mm. Started to think about, okay, so how can we support women entrepreneurs uh, mm. and the government? How, how can we fund them? You know, what sort of capacity building support can be given? In, mm. if they're coming the product, what sort of market opportunities can we create for those women and enable them to kind of repay that loan and become financially sustainable uh, over a mm. period of and, and so it was, it was very interesting. We did a number of focus group discussions, uh, you know, went on the ground, uh, started to understand what real challenges that women had. Uh, and <laughs> so it was, it was nice going to, uh, 
the Kikuyu County and uh, Mbakasi County uh, in, in Kenya, uh, learning a bit of Swahili, interacting with the locals. Uh, it, there is there's definitely that fun aspect of it. But I think underlying all of that was the very humble fact that people had genuine problems, right? So there was, yeah. there was a women entrepreneur uh, who was uh, farming catfish uh, okay. in, in her front yard. And mm. she said, you know, I didn't know that catfish take, you know, whatever long to mature and there is no market for immature catfish. So she didn't know that, right? So she, she got a ton of catfish to actually grow them in the front yard but she didn't know that she had to actually safeguard them for another 18 months or two years because she didn't know that there was no market for catfish which are which are mature and they have to mature and it'll take about two years time and until then she needed the infrastructure to keep them alive she had to protect them from passers-by who, who used to steal away fish uh, and feed them so it's it's basic information, but they didn't know that information. So things like that, I think, kind of made make you realize that oh, it's just such a simple thing of knowledge sharing. Yeah. All they had to do was just understand that you know this is this is how long it takes for it to go to the market. Yeah. So, I think so it's empowering them with those basic skill sets, capacity building in the front end, and then also supporting them through the. Uh, market connection enablement was something that we focused on while we were there. Uh, mm. not forget, you know, it was a personally, it was a great experience for me as well, cultural experience because yeah. working with colleagues from different backgrounds and different cultures. Yeah, uh, that's totally different to yours. Uh, uh, so it was a very good uh, lifetime experience, both personally, professionally. Uh, and I would almost say kind of that was probably one thing that motivated me to do an MBA from Lancaster as well, going to mm. the cultural uh, variety and significance. Okay, so that's that's your first step to you know understanding globally where you could take it forward, and you wanted to move to Lancaster University, and you still have a. a with them, I understand. So, if you could briefly explain your journey into Lancaster and then what what is continuing with Lancaster right now? Sure, sure. No, I definitely applied to Lancaster owing to their worldwide reputation and strategy. They're still ranked top two, top one uh, in corporate strategy in the yeah. world uh, mm -hmm. for their for their MBA. So that was my main motivation to choose Lancaster. And a couple other things was obviously the small class size and the diversity of the class, which was very important for me. Uh, mm. it was, we were about 48 of us from you know, 23, 24 different nationalities, which was something mm. appealing to me. And mm. it was a one year program. So it was definitely kind of inclined to uh, you know, be part of such a, such a cohort. So that was my mm. motivation initially to apply to Lancaster. And yeah, since then, you know, I've been in, I've been in contact as a very active uh, alumnus uh, supporting, you know, students as part of the PG admissions to mm -hmm. kind of understand how the program works and mm -hmm. also feedback and, you know, information to how the program can be improved uh, to, the, to the management school. And yeah, I'm still part of all the networking events and now virtual networking events. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but being an active member of uh, the alumni community, mm. and I would say, yeah, it's it's definitely it was definitely a uh, though it was for one year, it was definitely a life changing experience for me. Mm. You know, just living in Lancaster, kind of getting that exposure, and because it was a, a campus environment, yeah, uh, there was also this opportunity to interact with you know students from other parts of the university. You know, yeah. go and see what's happening in the chemistry lab or the physics lab or the Lancaster Environment Center. Uh, just, mm. just see what what what's happening, how synergies work. I think it was brilliant. And this whole personal aspect of living in a little uh, city, uh, you know, where you're you you have got an intense program at the same time, yeah. your intense program, but then you also want to balance out fun stuff. Uh, mm. 
friends and flatmates. I think, yeah, something that definitely stay on as a wonderful memory for me uh, at, at Lancaster. Awesome. And currently, you're also doing your PhD. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, what is that all about? So I, I picked it up uh, early last year when uh, a professor from Lancaster who is moving to Germany reached out to me uh, uh, asking, mentioning that there was this opportunity because I had previously mentioned to him that maybe in the long term I'd consider something like that uh, given my interest to say teach uh, to students at universities. So when this opportunity opened up he just flagged it to me. We had a conversation and I said, I'm not sure about doing it full time, really, but would definitely kind of try to explore that part time. So mm. it started, yeah, early last year, but practically, I would say late last year, that's when I kind of got my hands on to things, trying to understand, okay, how this works, uh, nailing down a research subject and topic. So mm. yes, I'm doing it part time currently from the University of Bamberg uh, mm. in, in Germany, South Germany. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's going to take a, a, a long time. It's, the, the end is not. Uh, it's, long it, it's not in sight anyway. But no. I'm super glad that I've actually embarked on it, just because uh, I feel it's it's a continuous learning opportunity. You know, mm. I, I interact with a number of current students at University of Bamberg, uh, professors, mm -hmm. there, researchers there. You know, trying to understand. You know what are what is it that they are looking at? What are they researching? So it's it just having conversations itself is a great learning opportunity, and mm -hmm. that's really appreciating. But at the same time, I'm also spending quite some time reading papers, talking to people, trying to understand the practical aspects of applying subjects like policy, governance, and strategy in the context of cities, because that's that's where my whole PhD revolves. So. Yeah, no, uh, excited, but I wouldn't have done a lot yet. Uh, no, no, way to no. Go. You are also a member of the UN Global Compact Network. What is that role all about and how, what exactly is your contribution to the UN Global Compact? Sure. Uh, so I, I learned about the global UN Global Compact probably about eight, nine years ago. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it was necessarily set up as UN Global Compact Network. I became a member of their network only about two years ago. Uh, but then uh, back in 2013, 2014, me and my cousin were actively engaged in uh, volunteering opportunities which were launched by UN online volunteering. Uh, called okay. the UN, UN website where mm -hmm. you know you can actually you know volunteer to finish off activities online mm -hmm. uh, so things like uh, would you be willing to teach English to mm -hmm. students in remote parts of Africa remote parts of India remote parts of South Asia mm -hmm. uh, one one hour per week or two hours per week or things like that so me and my cousin were actively involved in supporting those online volunteering opportunities. Wow. Uh, and then uh, I became part of something called the uh, World Community Grid as part of IBM, you know, remotely supporting research that happens, uh, say to, to prevent cancer, to prevent AIDS and things like that, where there was a heavy UN health uh, involvement. Mm. health point of view. So that's when I kind of came to know about UN Global Compact, which which yeah. uh, you know heavily focuses on sustainability, I would say. Uh, and I wouldn't say I'm like actively a member of uh, UN Global Compact Network, but I join their webinars quite often and try to understand, okay, you know, how are they addressing some of these uh, challenges in 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 delivering sustainable development goals. Mm. So it's it's from that point of view, it kind of aligns with the work that I do at Arab as well. So became mm. a member about two years ago, and 
yeah, I, I would say it's a great learning platform to help us kind of navigate that whole space and learn more about current things such as decarbonization, net zero, sustainability, circular economy. So from that perspective, I would say it's very, very helpful and useful to be part of that network. You also do pro bono consulting or volunteering. So is this a part of that or is it aside from it? Uh, I, I don't think both are linked. So no. definitely something that I do outside of work as a volunteer. Uh, okay. Something that I support a number of other organizations with. Uh, for instance, I was uh, uh, supporting an organization called Colors Foundation many years ago. Mm -hmm. Supporting another organization called Angel Pictures. All of this either on a more freelance or volunteering basis. Uh, mm -hmm. with part of my yeah, permanent role or full-time job. When I look at your profile, I'm so surprised because you are, you have definitely worked on your career and you have your career ambitions and goals, but uh, parallel, you've been always conscious of, you know, providing some time and space for social development and something, you know, uh, relating to the community, global community. How is that? What was the germ that that kick this off where did it happen that you need to put some space not just for you but also for people across the globe wherever possible i think it's a it's probably a very very personal thing uh, right so yeah i've i've received you know guidance and and support from a number of people be it family friends throughout my journey kind of helping me navigate supporting me in my decisions because mm. I've always been someone who made my own decisions, but then, you know, getting the right kind of guidance and support, uh, yeah. in kind of confirming that I've made the right decision was so important. And there were a number of instances where, you know, I didn't uh, know the right answers. I was like, okay, let me just take a plunge and see what's there rather than actually trying to find out whether it's the right thing to do. So, you know, looking back, I feel, the number of uh, not just me the number of others who who are looking to take that plan who are looking to kind of traverse that same journey yeah. and trying to really understand or struggle with resources that help them make those decisions mm. so yeah I, I feel it's just a just just a nice opportunity to give back uh, and help people who genuinely need help uh, mm. and stages or certain points in their in their career or pro personal or professional journey uh, and yeah. handhold them. You know, I don't think we we I, I don't think I necessarily provide answers, but you know it's just good to share experience and sometimes ask questions that makes them think about what they are doing or what they want to do. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's just that idea of giving back and helping someone who's genuinely in need of help uh you know makes you feel good isn't it so at the end of the day you feel yeah probably contributed a bit in helping shape this person's journey mm. that's awesome that's a lot i'm thinking to to be able to manage so many things what are the challenges that you have faced? It's not that easy. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, definitely not easy, but I think you definitely have to make time for some of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's very easy to, to say, sorry, I don't have time to speak to you about it and just share some links and resources. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the other hand, actually spending an hour or two mm -hmm. uh, with someone kind of you know listening to them walking them through you know what's the right thing to do what's going on in their head uh, yeah. so i would say yeah the challenge has been i commit to a number of things saying mm -hmm. yeah i'm definitely going to have a conversation with you and i, I would definitely keep up with those uh, appointments i would definitely yeah. connect with them uh, but at the expense of probably like you know not doing some of my own stuff uh, uh, so I, but I feel it at the end of the day, it's all worth it. Right. Mm -hmm. And people kind of really appreciate and 
personally, leave aside what others think, what I think about myself uh, is what matters to me. Uh, and at the end of the day, if I feel that you know, I've done something really good, uh, as a kind of probably taking an hour's nap or you know cooking something really nice, okay, at least I've helped this person you know, do this activity. So that makes me feel really, really good. So I would say, yeah, one thing that I definitely struggle with is, and we all do, I'm sure, uh, is uh, is this time. Uh, but but at the end of the day, you kind of really feel that you made a difference or contributed positively, and that kind of really makes you feel good. Not nothing else is important at the end when you have that feeling. That is awesome. How is your uh, family and friends supporting your initiatives because it's one thing that you are you know wanting to go into many directions and doing it but it's another thing to convince people to be committed to the same level right no, I, our dear ones. I, I probably say I'm very lucky on that front because uh, you know my my family and close friends strongly believe in in what I do and they they probably for some reason know that I would be doing the right thing and nobody kind of comes and questions or challenges or, or does anything. I definitely get a lot of uh, you know good advice in terms of you know be careful or do it the right way or yeah. it is always good. Uh, but no one kind of really stops me from doing things or anything like that. Everyone is encouraging. They all know why I'm doing what I'm doing and yeah. That that on board always, which is fantastic. And sometimes I think I also have a support network where I can kind of, you know, direct some of my queries that that come from somewhere else to my family or friends, saying, oh, you know what, I can actually direct you to my cousin who is really good at this, and mm -hmm. he is better placed to answer this. I don't think I am really well placed to answer this question, or you know, mm -hmm. maybe a, a friend of mine who used to work there still works there. Uh, mm. connect you with them you should have a conversation they might probably be well placed to answer your question than mm. kind of you know talking about it for another hour or so I think so that way we've got a really support network who, who take on some of my uh, you know some of my load in terms of having conversations with people and helping them as well so you have also used them as a resource your family and friends. And, and that they, they're very much willing, right? They, uh, love, they love doing that as well. So it's not a forced thing on them. No. They also feel really passionate about kind of reaching out, supporting. Uh, mm -hmm. So they are as much on board as I am, I would say. But yeah, I think it, it probably also kind of, uh, you know, reflects on some of, some of the basic values that we've all learned within the family. Uh, yeah. like, you know, put other person's needs first, you know, support them, you know, be helpful, have a positive attitude towards others. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of ingrained in the family. So every time I reach out to someone, they all know, yep, we're definitely up for it. Let's do it. Let's have some reason. How does one go about identifying his or her own career path? Right. I mean, it's, it's a difficult one, right? So, and absolutely, I think it's only uh, it's only us who can identify what we really want to do, and you know because we all own our own careers. No one can come and tell you what you should be doing. It's it's for us to kind of identify what we want to be doing. Uh, mm. I probably share my personal experience, right? So one, unless and until we actually get our hands dirty doing something, we will not know what is it that we want to do. Mm. Uh, so you probably definitely have to have practical experience or you know even if we have role models you know uh, we look at we can look at this person and go oh brilliant I definitely want to be that kind of a person but you never know what they're going through on a daily basis to be what they are so unless and until you get to experience uh, you know what what is it that takes to do something or be something uh, mm -hmm. Unless and until you do that, I don't think there is a clear yes or no in terms of this is the career path that I want to be taking. But at the mm -hmm. same time, yes, there are certain 
certain you know decisions that we have to make quite early on in terms of courses we enroll in or you know subjects exactly. we take or or things like that right so i would say you know when i when i uh, was making those important decisions i for sure knew that there were certain things which i didn't want to kind of explore I don't want to mention the subjects but for some reason i didn't feel so connected with a few subjects and therefore i said oh i'm definitely not going to you know impose that on me for the rest of my uh, professional life uh, so you could almost kind of start eliminating things rather than choosing things mm-hmm. um, so once you start kind of you know eliminating things from a long list of options mm-hmm. then that, that you can you kind of narrow down what is it that you really want to be doing mm-hmm. um and that helped me in making my decision around my bachelors and then following that it also helped me make my decision around choosing a job at IBM and then with an IBM i did explore a number of things i did a branding role for some time a technology role for some time uh you know a marketing role for some time a strategy role for quite some time and so all that kind of really give, gave me a taster in terms of what is involved in mm. things and which made me feel okay this is not something i want to be doing in the long term or this is something that i want to be doing in the long term mm. so sure there are other things that are out there which are not tried or tested which you know i might appreciate extensively but at least within the scope of what i have experienced and what i have worked on i would say you know unless until you really kind of get your hands dirty and jump into the pool you'll probably mm-hmm. not know how it feels and what it takes to be there mm-hmm. so so for anyone who's kind of trying to really make those decisions i would say question yourself in terms of what you really don't like uh, and start eliminating those things and rather than starting to think about what you really like and what you want to do so once you uh, so i mean if if you know what you want to do then that's a straightforward answer you should definitely kind of not give up and keep at it but if you don't know maybe starting to think about what is it that you don't want to do might narrow down some of your options i would say mm. and then the core bit that i mentioned around you know looking at a skill set not just from a technical point of view but also from an industry point of view i think is is so important so important yeah so you know if you if you have a chemical engineering background it's not necessary that you have to be a chemical engineer but you can work in the chemical industry but in the data job or or something else mm-hmm. so i think yeah it it's important to reflect on the fact that some of the technical skills that people think is core technical or functional can actually yeah. you know support in the in the industry domain aspect of things now that one has chosen a career path you know what are the key challenges one should be aware of ah uh, Or the one thing, I would say constant learning. I wouldn't mm. say it's a challenge; it's essentially an opportunity. Um, mm. Depends on how you see it, mm. but you know, continuously kind of keeping yourself abreast in terms of what's going on. You know, why is it happening? I think mm. it's definitely a, a challenge. We just cannot, and at the pace at which things are changing in the world today. we just cannot expect that something that you have learned 10 years ago is still valid and applicable right things change very quickly over time so how do you constantly keep yourself ahead of things is an important one uh, and then i would say you know there is again there is a heavy focus on uh, technical skills functional skills domain skills uh, mm-hmm. but then human skills right uh, you know these days every 5 years there's a new generation right so how do you actually deal with that changing workforce how do you interact with people how do you empathize in situations uh, you know how do you collaborate with uh, teams uh, multi generational teams uh, you know how do you share messages which are uh, you know which are easy to understand and in all this kind of doing this with a with with basic things like empathy kindness uh, is is something 
that uh, you know is is not heavily spoken about. Mm -hmm. I it it probably should take the front seat. I wouldn't say it's a challenge, but it's also important to acknowledge that while having conversations about technical skills and domain skills and sector industry skills, it's also important to have conversations about human skills and how relatable you are to someone uh, and you know building trust, I think is such an important thing. So where are you learning all those skills? So you know just getting a job and you know doing that the piece of work is not sufficient but landing that job in the right way, developing trust with your clients mm. uh, and ensuring that you're able to collaborate with your teams, you know, having a nice work environment, all of those are so important. So the challenge is how do you, how do you kind of embrace those, how do we all start to embrace those aspects or skills uh, while we're working uh, is, is so important. So that's one thing I would say. And then, you know, constantly kind of being curious, you know, as to why we are doing what we are doing. I think this is one thing that I tell my team as well. Mm. You know, we're saying something, but why are we saying what we are saying? We just don't want to say it because it's a nice thing to say. You know, it has mm. to be constantly evidenced by, you know, a fact or, or some data point or, or, or something. Uh, you know, just because you your gut says this is the right thing to do, yes, at some point that's important as well. But mm -hmm. then, you know, in 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 some in in a number of professions, it's so important to kind of evidence why you're saying what you're saying and why we are doing what we are doing. Mm -hmm. And as long as we're able to justify for ourselves that yes, this is the right thing to do or right thing to say, then I think we can definitely uh, convince others on that messaging. So I would say that's probably another uh, challenge to, to kind of yamal over and think about. Mm. Awesome. Top three important things that comes to your mind one should be aware of before making the commitment to a change. So now you're ready. You have chosen the path. You're you are aware of the challenges, but now I want to make a commitment. So, top three things that you think we should be aware of? Uh, it, it's not always going to be smooth and easy. Uh, you will definitely face challenges. So be prepared and be resilient to face those uh, challenges, I think is one. Don't think that you've kind of done all your background homework and you're really, it's going to be a smooth ride. I don't think it's going to be. And then um, be humble and open to learning. Um, there is no harm in saying that I don't know or, or I'm not aware rather than just, you know, building castles on nothing. Yeah. Right? So, so be humble and be open to say I don't know, I think is mm -hmm. an important one. And I think the third one is um, top three. Okay. Uh, I'm just thinking about my personal experience again. Uh, is is probably just kind of listening uh, and trying to understand what's what's out there. You know, why are people saying something? You know, what's going on? And developing mm. the human skills. You yeah, know, I feel that we are kind of really equipped with all the technical skills, but you know. If we take, if we push those human skills in the forefront and kind of carry on with it, the technical skills will automatically come and stick to you. I feel, uh, mm -hmm. provided you have the right knowledge, right people, right network. So I would say those are probably the three things. Again, on the top of my head, I might have more, and maybe not in the priority order, but those things come to my mind. That's absolutely awesome. Is there anything else that you want to say to the audience? that you might have missed out or I might have missed to ask? I mean, um, especially for, again, I, I can speak for myself uh, just because I've been through that journey of, uh, you know, doing an MBA and changing sectors. Um, I would say definitely spend some time in the industry before deciding um, you know what you want to be doing at a master's level or at a doctorate level because 
having some practical experience really helps you make some very wise decisions in terms of what you want to be doing and where your interest lies. Uh, so that's one thing I would say, practical experience, trying it out, testing it out really, really is helpful. Yeah. Um, and yeah, never, never fail to uh, learn, continuously keep learning, you know, every opportunity to speak to someone, network with someone, uh, you know, read a paper, read an article, write an article, everything is an opportunity to learn, you know, you might not know what you have learned, but you'll be reflecting on it, you know, at some point you'll feel, oh, actually I've worked on this article and through that I have learned about this or I know this knowledge. And I think the third and most important thing is something that I've learned quite early on um, while at mm -hmm. IBM. Uh, it was uh, uh, in 2012, I think, or 2011, when Jini Ramati became IBM CEO. Uh, mm -hmm. they, in her first message, Jini mentioned that you know, growth and comfort do not coexist. Uh, and there was this beautiful, no. there was this beautiful story about treasuring wild ducks, uh, which, which is something that I keep telling, you know, all my, all my friends and, uh, you know, people that I meet. So it's about, I'll be very quick in sharing this. Uh, oh, please do. <laughs> uh, but I, I would definitely kind of recommend people to look, go up, uh, look up on Google and, and search, but mm -hmm. you know, there is a flock of wild ducks, uh, flying one day. And one of them in search of food, obviously. And when I say wild, wild ducks are ducks which can fly. And mm -hmm. one of them actually saw a barn where a farmer was feeding his domestic ducks. So okay. wild duck, one of this wild duck thought to itself, why can't I just go to the barn? The farmer might feed me as well. Mm -hmm. So leaving aside the flock, this one single wild duck flew into the a barn. And the farmer more than welcomed it with open arms and he fed the wild duck as well, besides the other domestic ducks and it laid eggs. So obviously the farmer was happy. Uh, it stayed there for a day, for two days, for a week, for a month. Uh, and then, yeah, the farmer was very happy. The duck was very happy because it didn't have to go in search of food. Mm -hmm. And after about two months, it saw its flock flying over the barn and it mm -hmm. wanted to go and join the flock again, but it couldn't fly uh, because it had gained weight uh, and had become domesticated. Uh, so so this, the, the moral of the story is you can make a wild duck tame, but you can never make a tame duck wild again. Uh, <laughs> so it is a beautiful story which resonated me at all levels. It was something that uh, Ginny mentioned quite early on in probably one of her uh, introductory uh, messages to, to the entire firm that, you know, treasure the wild duck in you. Uh, and absolutely, I think I'd probably that's one last message that I'd like to give everyone saying, yeah, treasure the wild duck in you. Don't <laughs> want to domesticate it because, you know, we, we can only define who we are and our brand. Don't leave that job anybody else. That is awesome. There is still one important thing, COVID. So all the things that we talked about, the challenges and how do we do and so on, but then you also personally have endured it to know that the challenges are pretty high, the stakes are pretty high, and there's also some parts of the world that still not recovered. What is your response? the situation and for people listening and feeling oh hey I want to I'm inspired I want to do something but I am struck I I mean it, it's a passing pace I think we all have just have to be patient you know things are not going the way it's, it has to go or the way you had planned it to go I think it's completely fine uh, mm -hmm. I think just kind of staying put and staying patient because the whole it's not something that we alone are struggling with it's the entire world so we should just give it time to heal um, but at the same time one thing that we absolutely can do is be kind be humane mm. uh, uh, to others you never know what situation people are in 
you know, what's going on in, in everybody's lives. So I think mm. it's pathetic and uh, appreciative of the fact that each one might be dealing with a number of different problems. Uh, I think is the best thing that we all can do at this time. And personally, I think that would be my kind of uh, message for everyone saying that whoever you work with, your family, your friends, your colleagues, your kids, uh, I think just just be kind and, and humane. Uh, you know, this is definitely something that, that has hit all of us really hard in some mm. way or other, but yeah, let's just give it some time, be patient. And while you're doing that, let's let's appreciate what everyone is going through and be kind and human. Awesome. Raghuveer, if somebody wants to reach out to you for career guidance or support, what kind of people can reach out to you? or what is the group that you are trying to support uh, either personally or through your pro bono consulting and how do they reach I, I mean, yeah, LinkedIn is definitely a, a, a nice platform. I'm happy to connect with people there. In terms of audience, there is there is no one specific you know, uh, audience, I would say. You know, any, definitely any MBA aspirants who are looking to pursue their uh, MBAs wherever in the world. Definitely happy to kind of share my knowledge, insights, uh, and you know help them make those decisions. Definitely keen. Uh, mm. And even otherwise, if someone has any thoughts about career development or making professional decisions, mm. really keen to support them. Uh, again. You know, being part of the alumni community at Lancaster, I think that's one thing that uh, I definitely feel very close to, not just for a potential prospective Lancaster MBA students, but, you know, MBA students in general. So no yeah. bias, uh, but, but very keen to support. So, yeah, definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, and I think LinkedIn is, is the best platform to reach out to. Um, mm. And otherwise, yeah, they can reach out to you and uh, you can then share my email ID or other personal details with them. Sure. That is awesome. Raghuvi, this was an absolute treat. I totally enjoyed and I'm also motivated to try out certain things that you said. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for inviting me to be, to be part of this uh, change management series of sessions, Komati. Really enjoyed the conversation as well. And for everyone watching it, yeah, definitely, uh, you know, take a look at uh, the, the repository of uh, sessions that Gomati has uh, on the website. Very useful. And please do reach out if you have any questions or would like to learn more. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye. This was an absolute treat for me to understand change management from a consultant perspective. Thank you so much, Raghuveer. And I'm sure most of you that have viewed this episode would have also found something interesting to go back to. If you're liking more of such um, episodes, please do remember to like, share and subscribe. And also remember to share your feedback in the comment section because that is how we are learning from each other and growing this global community. Signing off from the Glaze Studio, this is Gomati Sivasankaran. Bye-bye.